The front of a stone church is obscured a little bit by some grayish green leaves and trees. The stage has interlocking stones, potted plants, and scattered chairs, and benches around by, surrounded by a painted mural with flowers and doves. Near the center of the stage is a mic stand where the in-person performers will be entering and exiting. Tessa stands with the microphone. Hey everyone, I'm Tori Pop, and I'm the festival manager for the Winnipeg Fringe Theatre Festival. And I am pleased to uh, welcome you here to our 2020 Virtual Yours hashtag Winnipeg Fringe live stream event. Uh, I know it's certainly strange not having the 33rd annual Fringe take place this summer, and I'm definitely going to miss seeing some familiar faces running from venue to venue in the Exchange District. Um, and I know that our uh, performers and patrons, volunteers and staff are going to miss the fun and excitement of our favorite summer festival. Uh, but we're so pleased to be able to bring you some online content featuring some ret returning fringe performers, some new performers, and some uh, original content created just for this online event. So hopefully we can find some of that fringe spirit this summer. Uh, I'd like to give a big shout out to our government funders who have continued to uh, their support of us this year and has made it available to us to make this online event. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, our sponsors, Liquor Mart and Assiniboine Credit Union, who have been dedicated to us in making this happen. Uh, and we also uh, receive a whole bunch of support from our community members throughout the year. So thank you so much to our 2019 Fringe sponsors uh, and supporters, and we hope to see you back in 2021. So that's enough for me. Um, I am so pleased to introduce your host for this evening. You've seen him on stages across Winnipeg and uh, across Canada. And he's also been an important and dedicated Fringe staff member since 2008. I am happy and pleased to present your host, Ray Strawn. The Winnipeg Fringe Theatre Festival and Royal Manitoba Theatre Centre are proud to call Winnipeg home. Winnipeg is located on Treaty 1 land, the traditional territory of the Indian Ute, Anishinaabe, and Dakota peoples, and homeland of the Métis Nation. We are thankful for the benefits sharing this land has afforded us, and we are committed to the responsibilities of the treaty. Hai hai, miigwech, wopera, and marci. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Here we are, day two, Winnipeg Fringe, virtually yours. Uh, of course, we can't be with you in person. We can't be at Old Market Square. We can't be in the exchange, but uh, what we can do is we can bring you some amazing Fringe Entertainment, uh, some amazing Fringe people, and with me right now, I have an amazing Fringe co-host, Jordan. Hey, everybody. I'm very excited to be here tonight. So, quickly, what's your experience with the Winnipeg Fringe Festival? Well, I started probably with 100 decibels, as you can see here on my shirt. Uh, back in 2014, that was my first kind of entrance into it. We performed, I have gone as an audience member, of course, but uh, certainly this year is different than it has been in the past. And certainly because of it's online, it's too bad we can't have it in person. But I would say that's probably my experience with Fringe so far. Okay, so 2014 was the first year you performed with 100 Decibels or is it the first year that 100 Decibels started as a theater company? First year with 100 Decibels. That's when we established the group, 2014. Excellent, excellent. Remember that, folks, folks at home, this is an interactive show. 2014, the first year of 100 decibels. That might come back later on. So remember that. Keep that in the front, middle, and back of your brain. Uh, once again, I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, yep, write it down. <laughs> you betcha. Uh, other than 100 decibels, you know, you've, we've seen you on Winnipeg stages. Uh, what, what do we might have seen you re in recently? Well, you'll see other performances later with Echo Theater. And I got involved with them during Shakespeare Fest. I did a monologue as Hamlet. And uh, so this sign that you're looking at right now is a sign that we use for Hamlet. And maybe some of you know what it means and some of you don't. But uh, that's kind of where I've been involved with Echo Theater. And also along with 100 decibels in the fringe. Yes, definitely. Uh, I would like to say hello to Mel, uh, our describer online. And uh, also, hello everyone out there. Don't forget to say hi to us. Give us a like. 
give us a comment, be interactive, and tell us where you're from so we know that you're out there. Okay, Hi, Mel, so go ahead and give us a description. Thank you so much. Ray and Jordan, our wonderful hosts, sit in tan colored patio chairs facing forward. A small red table sits between them. Ray is a black man with medium brown skin and Jordan is Filipino with tan skin. They are both clean shaven with shaved heads and they both wear black t-shirts with gray or khaki pants. A banner for the Winnipeg Fringe Theater Festival hangs behind them. There are faux trees and gray pots sculpted into spiralized pillars on either side of the lounge. The screen will be split with one screen showing the performers and hosts and the other screen will feature the ASL interpreters. They wear black against a white background. Thank you. So, who do we have uh, with us tonight? Well, our first act of the evening is Adam Schwartz. He's actually homebred here in Winnipeg. Uh, he's done a fireside chat with himself, uh, autistic com comedian that he is. And here is Adam Schwartz. Adam is a balding comedian who's on the verge of getting plump. His pronouns are he and him. He's standing in a microphone. Okay. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? So, in a world, in a world, in a world where people have sex more often than they walk, take out their garbage or wash their dishes in the story about a man sex left behind. Oh, that's me. Hi, everyone. My name is Adam Schwartz. I'm a stand-up comedian on the autism spectrum, uh, which... Uh, when I was 12, my mom called me in the kitchen and she said, I've got some bad news. And I said, what, we're out of Pop-Tarts? And she was like, no, honey, you've got autism. And I thought for a second, hmm, thank God. So does it mean we still have Pop-Tarts? I just thought being autistic meant I was predisposed to being an autist. So I tried my hand at finger painting, that didn't work. I tried my hand in pottery. That didn't work well either. I wasn't even the best autist in the class. That was Kyle. But doing some comedy, I feel like I finally felt my ult. I've never felt more autistic than I do right now. So autism is a neurological difference characterized by poor social skills, trouble making eye contact, and narrow interests, amongst many other qualities. Uh, when I first heard the definition, I was like, no, my interests are vast when I come to the care about, like Donkey Kong Country, and Donkey Kong Tennis, and Donkey Kong Racing. Uh, but there were some signs that was different. Like in elementary school, I was so bullied, I crushed a dummy, it would be like, man, you've got it rough. Uh, so, uh, being an autistic comedian, people ask me all kinds of uh, questions. Like the other day, I was doing a comedy show, and someone said, uh, so you don't really have autism, do you? Because you're not at all like my cousin Mike. Uh, and I was like, no. No, I don't. I'm just telling jokes about being autism, so you'll make out with me. Because, you know, all girls want a guy who understands him slightly less than all other guys or stares at his friend's chest because he can't make eye contact. Uh, the other day I was doing a presentation, because I sometimes do presentations in between comedy gigs, uh, and someone at the presentation uh, for social workers asked me, so what do people with autism do for their birthdays? I was like, well, all people with autism go to this special restaurant designed for people with autism, so I feel like, like we've got a choice without really being a comfort zone. The choice of ravioli, or ravioli, or ravioli. It still takes me 20 minutes to decide. 
Am I, mm, do I want the ravioli? Or the ravioli? No, I know. I'll go with ravioli. Uh, so at the same presentation, uh, someone said, gee, you should go into politics. Uh, no, I shouldn't. For one thing, it's got no filter. So I'd be a horrible liar. For another thing, I'm so... Or ravioli. Or ravioli. So how am I going to decide whether you're bomb Russia? Bomb Russia. Or bomb Russia. And since I'd be so useless at it, I'd probably get elected. And then whenever I mess up, people will be like, at least he doesn't act like a politician. And then I do want to date a porn star that looks exactly like my daughter. Uh, so at that same uh, birthday that I just mentioned at the restaurant, uh, someone said, uh, someone got me a birthday present. Uh, it was a phone book. Let me tell you something, guys. The phone book is a horrible read. There's no character development or plot. And at one point, they introduced this Smith character who must be a spy or something, but they keep changing identities. Like at one moment, it's Ira Smith. Then it's Kendall Smith. And then it's Lionel Smith. And then they move on to the Stuart character, who I'm sure is a really lovely guy. But I really want to know what happened to Smith. Uh... And the ending of the phone book is so predictable. Uh, so the menus at uh, restaurants are way too long. If I really wanted to do that much work, I would have just stayed home and cooked my own dinner. And having uh, menus are really com complicated for someone who's uh, extremely literal and has awe to them. Uh, like I was looking at a menu and it said, uh, a red-headed hooker, sex on the beach. And I thought, that sounds exotic. I'll get that. So I was a dis bit disappointed when my drink arrived 15 minutes later. Uh, and then on the menu, it said, uh, sex in a pan. And I was like, have they seen my booty? There's no way I'm fitting in a pan. Uh... And then I was with someone, and they said that they were going to get death by chocolate. I was like, don't do it. You've got a lot to live for. Uh, servers are definitely not trained for dealing with people with autism. Uh, like, at the end of the night, my server asked me, so what are you planning on doing tonight? I was like, I don't have any plans. And then she was like, and I said, what are you doing? And she said, uh, well, I'm going home to my be with my boyfriend and we're going to play video games. So what she was trying to say is I'm going home to be with my boyfriend but what I heard was we're playing video games. When I come. And boy did they give me weird looks when I showed up with chips later. I could never be a server because I've got sensory overload issues and you can't exactly go up to a large table and be like, can everyone shut up? I can't take your order if you all keep talking. Shh, zip it. Shh, that's it. No food for you. Uh, so one of my friends who's a server is also an actress. That sounded like a fun job, uh, but it's not exactly a good fit for someone with autism because we have a hard time reading and showing emotions. This is what it would look like. Begin scene. Guess what? What? There's a 15% discount with Giant Tiger. Wow. End scene. Next scene. Guess what? What? You just won the lottery. Wow. End scene. Next scene. Begin scene. Guess what? What? I have a hangnail. Oh, man. But there are some jobs that would be great at, however, like air traffic control. Because I'm so monotone, no one can ever tell when I'm freaking out. You might want to make a left. Those two planes are going to collide. Uh, so, 
uh, meeting a woman at the bar is really hard when you've got autism. Uh, fortunately, after one show, someone had left me their phone number They'd, in the men's washroom. It said, call Stacy for a good time. So I thought, hmm, I want to have a good time. I'll look into that. So when I called her up, I was like, let's play Monopoly. <laughs> so when she showed up, she was like, hey there, big spender. Want to spend some money on me? I was like, great, you're here. You can be the symbol. I'll be the boot. So when I called her up three weeks later, she was like, okay, but this time, I get to be the boot. Uh, it's hard meeting a woman at the bar, especially since I'm, uh, autistic men, and me especially, aren't exactly woman's first choice. There's no woman out there who like, mmm, I'm sick of the... I'm so sick and tired of those rich, successful, hunky hunks. Where can I find a guy with autism? They're so plain looking and boring and poor. Mmm. I want a piece of that. Mmm. He's so boring. I bet he could cure my insomnia. Mmm. He's going bald. Hubba Bubba. So our best bet is to find a divorced woman who's already found her prince charming and have him turn out to be a narcissistic dingbat. <laughs> then maybe they'll get plain old boring out of a chance. So I thought I'd found the perfect woman. Her ex-husband turned out to be gay. Uh, I had always wanted to be in a couple's, uh, in a relationship where we had couples pet nicknames for each other like Sweetums or Sweet Meat. Her pet nickname for me was Butt Face. We had a magical time together, uh, but when I texted her, she never replied. Uh, it probably doesn't help that I asked her such serious questions uh, right off the hop. Like I said, what's your favorite dinosaur? I know, that's way too serious. You shouldn't ask the woman that until you've already met her parents and they're planning on moving in together. Besides, it's a bit of a redundant question. After all, everyone's favorite dinosaurs are pterodactyl. I'm not really good at making small talk with anyone. Uh, like I was on this autism uh, support forum and I was worried about my first day of work. And so I wrote uh, about how I was worried about making small talk. And he was like, look, Adam. Someone replied, look, Adam, talking to guys is easy. All you have to do is talk about sports, video games, or boobs. So, I got, so my first day, I saw a guy by the water cooler. And I went up to him. And I was like, how about that local sports team? Boobs? Uh, so someone from Human Resources came and got me. And they were giving me a tour around the workplace. They said, by the way, we celebrate Casual Friday here. So I got super excited. So the next day, I show up to work half an hour late in my sweatpants and a shirt that said born to be meh across it. And then I slapped my boss in the butt. I said, good going there, toots. Everyone kept giving me such weird looks. Turns out it was only Tuesday. Having autism, we really stick out like a bad penny. I mean, there's lots of things that are easier to hide than having autism, like being nine months pregnant, or being wanted for murder, or having a wooden peg leg. So when I had dis disclosed about my disability uh, in the workplace to get some accommodations, and I told my supervisor that I was autistic, he was like, uh, no, you're not. I said, I'm pretty sure I would know if I've got autism or not. And he was like, no, if you had autism, right now you'd be in Las Vegas making millions of dollars. So when I told another supervisor that I was autistic, he was like, oh yeah? Then who won the 1964 World Series? And I explained, that's Google. Then he was like, hey, Carl, get hold of Adam. He says he's got autism. And then Carl was like, oh yeah? then what am I thinking right now? And I'd be like, hmm, I don't know. But if I had to guess, probably something to do with boobs. 
And it was like, wow. You really can read minds. Uh, so making small talk with work at work is really hard. Like the other day, uh, two of my coworkers and I were outside, and one of them pulled out a pack of cigarettes and said, do you want one? I said, no, thank you. And they offered one to my other coworker, and he said, sure, why not? And it's like, I didn't know you smoked. He said, sometimes I smoke socially. You can't get away with any other bad habits socially. Like, you can't just fart up a storm and be like, I only fart socially. And you can't go hog wild picking your nose and be like, I only pick my nose socially. And you can't be racist socially. Uh, so I went to these social skills classes put on by Autism Society of Manitoba uh, to learn some social skills. Uh, they taught some really great things, like that you should always shower every single day, and that you should uh, put on deodorant after the gym before going on a date. They also taught us how to compliment women. Like, this is what it looked like. So, uh, Isaac, how would you compliment a woman? You've got a really nice smile, like my mom. No, girls do not want to be compared to your mom. Jacob, do you want to go next? You've got a really nice leather purse. Why, thank you. Do you know that it takes six cows to make a leather purse? No, girls do not want to know how many cows are in the leather purse. Adam, do you want to go next? I like trains. That's great, but that's not really a compliment. Do we try again? Trains have made of metal and go toot toot. Uh, so we also learned some great social rules, like how when you go give someone a hug, you should never hug someone for more than three Mississippis. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, before it becomes creepy. And it's especially creepy when you count out those three Mississippis out loud. <laughs> they also taught us other great rules, like how when you go up to a woman, uh, you, should, if, you should never ask them if they're pregnant. They may be, but you shouldn't ask. Uh, but if you do, you have to be quick on your feet and be like, you know, are you due for a pay raise because you've been working your tail off. You should also never go up to a woman and ask them if, they're on a, if it's their time of the month, no matter how irritating or irritable they seem. You should never ask. But if you do, you can be quick on your feet, but you know that you're telling the months to be your hydro bill. You should also never go up to a woman and ask them if they're on a diet, no matter how much you think they should be. You shouldn't ask. They won't appreciate it. But if you do, you can be quick on your feet, but you know, are you on a gluten-free diet? Do they want to take your pizza? You guys have been such a great audience, I'll give you the bonus rule. When someone goes around showing up pictures of their grandchildren and saying, aren't they the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? You should never say, I've seen better. <laughs> so based on those rules, I came up with a rule for everyone else. So uh, woman, you should never tell someone with autism to go fuck themselves at a house party. because it just creates an enormous lineup for the washroom. I thought it deserved more, but whatever. Uh, and we also did role-playing. I got super excited. I thought, here we go. I'm wearing my Asgardian helmet with plus five charisma and social dexterity. So apparently it's never appropriate to wear body armor in a church basement, especially not in Manitoba. But for some reason, the only people that came to those classes and got a date were the two instructors. Although I did eventually become really good at talking to women in a church basement, especially when there are no women around. Uh, so uh, one woman did try to set me up with her friend. When I asked why it would be a good couple, she said, uh, because you guys are both socially awkward. Uh, you wouldn't go up to a plump person and be like, you should go to my friend, because you guys are both candidates for type two diabetes. 
And you wouldn't go up to someone and be like, you should go with my friend. Because neither one would be very clever. <laughs> Yet she had no problem going up to me and telling me I should go with her friend because they're both socially awkward. Doesn't she realize that no one likes people who are socially awkward? Not even people who are socially awkward? <laughs> so we did eventually meet. We had this amazing conversation where we stared deeply into each other's chests since neither one of us could make eye contact. Well, I stared at her chest when I was talking. When she was talking, she stared at the ground. At one point, I don't think she even realized when I went to the washroom, because when I got back, she was still talking. Uh, so, some people try to make me feel better about myself. myself. They're like, yeah, Adam, but dating is tough for everyone. I mean, I can't decide whether I should swipe left or right. Where are all the nice guys out there? And then I'm like, I'm right over here. I'm wide open. <laughs> uh, so online dating is supposed to be really good for people with autism because it gives you more time to think about your answers. So I messaged this one girl, hey, five seconds later, she messaged me back, hi. So three weeks later, I messaged her, how's it going? I know, I should have wrote, what do you think we should buy mom for Mother's Day? So I also joined a small Jewish dating website called JDate. I was able to fill out the first part all right. I was able to give my credit card information. Where it got tricky was when it asked for my occupation, the choice of a doctor, lawyer, or businessman. And when I tried to click other, I kept saying, access denied. You're disappointed to your mother. And I was like, how do they know? So I had to join Christian Mingle instead. I hope I meet a nice Jewish girl in there. So uh, online dating is also supposed to be great because it uh, allows you to meet many more people, which is very important because I'm really picky about the woman I'm willing to date. I'm only willing to date three types of women, Swedish, Spanish, and the living. <laughs> Dead people is where I draw the line. I reject them. They don't reject me. Although there was this one time I messaged this woman. I thought she was ghosting me. Turns out she was ghosting everyone. <laughs> So, uh, are there any women here willing to make out with me? <laughs> I guess my journey of being the man whose sex left behind continues. So if I had to give you the performance review as an audience, I'd say I really appreciate you guys coming. You guys are a bit slow on some of the jokes. <laughs> But I'm glad you guys are here. Thank you. Thank you, Adam Schwartz. That was hilarious. Um, just so you know, who we have here for the, the remainder of the evening will be joined with Echo Theater Imagination Situation coming up next. Ryan Adam Wells, Anjali Sandu, I'm not Taylor Swift. Uh, we have Sick and Twisted Theater, uh, Trigger Warning, Contagion, and we end the night off with fringe favorite Mike Delamont doing co God is a Scottish gr Drag Queen, if I can say it correctly, the Pandemic Edition. So stick with us. We have a great night as usual. Night two, we're partying, and we have a very special guest from Saskatoon Fringe, Ulyssa Campos, joining us. Hi. Um, hey. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? Yep, sounds good. I mean, I can't hear, but I can see you through the interpreter, if that's what you're asking. Um, um, can, I'm not sure if my video is working, like my art is working. Is it? Yes? No? Yep. Yep, perfect. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Julissa Campos. I'm from Saskatoon, and I'm on behalf of 25th Street uh, Theatre also known as the Saskatoon Fringe. 
Um, so this year, due to the pandemic, um, as you all know, festivals had to be canceled. So this year, Anita Smith, the executive director, came with this brilliant idea of transforming the festival into a mixture of online uh, digital plays and um, live performance respecting the, the protocols and safety um, regulations of the government scheduling um, telling us. So we have also camps. So first of all, we have Collaboration Station, which is a, a series between uh, of ch for children camps where um, we'll have in-person camps and online. So the kids can watch the videos on, at home and create their own plays, design their own little sets, uh, create their own music. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a combination of a lot of uh, local artists that were recording what we do, and then it will be released on the French website so the kids can watch it at home. And then they can also come during the week of the French, July 31st until August 8th, they can come in the morning to do some crafts and work on what they want to create as their own French show uh, in their own backyard. Yeah, so that's our, our kids camp. And then we have the digital performances. So we have um, a total of 10 live digital performances and a combination of different artists, locals, and out of uh, Saskatoon. I think we have one company from Montreal. And uh, yeah, so they're going to be live stream, and you can go to 25th Street Theater.org and then you can find the whole schedule with the time. So if you want to see completely free, um, and you can jump some great art from these tech savvy artists, right? And then we have also the Live in Your Lawn. I'm part of that, I'm also putting a the show there. So, what we're doing in Live in Your Lawn is people are going to enter a draw and offer their backyard for us to perform a show. A brand new show where three local companies and people will pick the company, the show that they want to see, host it in the backyards. Um, it's only for a household, so it's it's private. It's not open to public. It's only open to the household who's willing to host the performance. Um, my show is called The Ungrateful Immigrant, and it's a um, comedic show about what, um, what people think that it's taking for granted as for us as immigrants, you know, what should we be grateful for and what shouldn't we be grateful for? Um, so yeah, it's a comedy um, about those situations that most of the newcomers, immigrants, refugees face all the time um, here in Canada. Um, during the whole week, we also have uh, something called Engage Big Conversations, where many conversations about different topics were recorded previously and are going to be released during the week of French. Again, you can find the schedule um, on their website. And yeah, we have different topics like systematic racism, gender identity in theater, indigenizing theater, can be theater, can theater be green, and the community of theater. So they have different topics that you're more than welcome to join. Again, it's completely free and it's something to do during this um, great time, right? Like, uh, even though summer it's kind of like slow because some of the festivals have been canceled, at least we have something to do and you can watch it from home. And there are different games. They will have French food, um, a game with local people, and you can watch it online about like common questions about the French festival. We have also uh, Shakespeare, Matt Lips. Again, it's a, it's a game between artists and you can watch it online too. And then at the end of every day, at the end of every show, you will have the free. And then you will tell me what's coming up next, next day and why you're looking forward. Sorry, I kind of rumble a lot. And then we have <laughs> <laughs> it's called Us at Home. And this project has been a collaboration with all the community associations here in the city. Um, and it's, uh, it's where we have invited many artists and youth to create their own videos about what it's like to be at home during the pandemic. So the French is creating a little house for them to um, release all the views, project all the views with participants, and people can come at any time during the whole festival to watch views and their stories about what's like to be in the pandemic. Wow, you guys are packing it in. You guys will not let the French spirit die. Amazing. Blessed to you guys. Yeah. Uh, quickly, what's uh, challenging and what's exciting about online content? Um, it is challenging because we have to figure out how to work with new technology, right? It's something that we were thrown into this pot and just like try to figure out, right? Or was art to that? But um, it is exciting to still be able to create art during this time. It's something to do to people, a purpose for artists to keep creating. 
Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and remember, uh, remind us where we can find the information about uh, what Saskatoon Fringe is doing online. Absolutely, so it's 25thstreettheater.org. 25thstreettheater.org. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Ulyssa. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, of course, of course. All the best to Saskatoon Fringe and much love from Winnipeg. Likewise, all the best and enjoy the Fringe Festival. All right, take care, take care. Thank you, bye. Hi. See ya. So yeah, there, there it is. The fringe spirit will never die. We will create art no matter what. Uh, who do we have next? Next act is through Echo Theatre, right based home here in Winnipeg, with Charlene Van Buchenhout. This piece is called Imagination Situation. It was created by Jen McDonald and Charlene Van Buchenhout. Sydney is bored. Two frontline workers in the imagination department of Sydney's brain have called an emergency meeting to help. Sydney has been in self isolation with her family for 423,000 hours, it feels like. And she's getting bored. Boredom is okay sometimes, but Sydney's imagination sparks have maxed out. Luckily, Ellie and Jojo, two frontline workers in the imagination department of Sydney's brain, have called an emergency Zoom meeting to help Sydney get her groove back. A physically distanced one, of course. Echo Theatre. This features stick figures and, and illustrations. illustrations. The live, the live section, section opens up on two imagination factory workers. Who used in her, her. Oh, no, no. Jojo. Jojo is Jojo with long, long, long hair, hair wearing, wearing a shirt and a purple She's, She's on, on the, the left, left of the screen, screen. and we and only, only see her in shoulders. shoulders. Ellie, Ellie is, is a white coated person, person and a medium, medium with black hair. hair. She's, She's wearing, wearing black, black and white striped, striped top and denim and overalls. overalls. She's, She's on, on the right, right side of the screen. screen. The background is black, black with many colorful types. There are in the imagination department of the brain. As you can imagine, some props are imaginary. Throughout the show, other characters will appear. In order, in order for parents, parent, tech, tech support, support, a big, a big fluffy, fluffy hat with white, white brown, brown and gray, gray fur. They wear a head head and an office and a computer. Creative, creative space. space. They talk to her about the creative space. space. Her her with a tiny spider made around the computers with a purple body. body. He has his googly eyes. eyes. At the At end, end, they'll be returning to the factory to This is Sydney. Sydney is 11 years old and 4 feet 7 inches tall. She loves jumping rope, playing with her best friend Taryn, coloring, reading mystery novels, narwhals, sea turtles, threadfin butterfly fish, well, anything to do with the ocean, really. This is her little brother, Carl, her dog, Reggie, her mom, Pat, her dad, Brian, and her favorite journal that even has a lock and key because it's private and no one's business, so keep out. Sydney has been in self-isolation with her family for 423,000 hours, it feels like, and she's getting bored. I mean, boredom is okay and can sometimes spark imagination, but for Sydney, her spark has maxed out. Luckily, Ellie and Jojo, two frontline workers in the imagination department of Sydney's brain, are working tirelessly to keep things running smoothly. But with the social distance protocols in place, it's making things a little trickier. Let's go inside Sydney's brain. Stations ready. Imagination levels power up. Imagination levels powered. Start popsicle test. Popsicle test begins. Melty. Frosty. Creamy. Yummy. Whippy. 
sparkles. Really? Yeah. All right. Popsicle test complete. Everything looks normal. The data looks stable. Great, let's get to work. Red block. Red block. Red block. Sparkle pencil. Sparkle pencil. Sparkle pencil. Umbrella. Oh, umbrella. Umbrella. Glass of water? Glass of water. Thanks. What? The emergency buzzer? Oh, dear. Oh, something seems to be blocking the flexibly integrated structure of the dynamic mental workspace. Oh, disabling conscious manipulation to the widespread neutral network. Huh? The imagination levels are plummeting. Oh, what in the world? Let me check the monitor. Okay, well, it appears ideas are still bubbling up. Creative juices flowing. All chemical and ar architectural environments are clear. Incubation full speed ahead. It looks like everything is synergistically synergizing smoothly. Huh? Oh, it looks like everything is still okay. Maybe it was just a fluke. Oh, great, let's get back to work. Try the bypass key. Oh. Nothing. Try turning it off and turning it back on again. No, nothing. No. Uh, Let's try tech support. Great idea. Calling tech support. This is tech support, where your needs are our needs. What is your department at issue? This is the imagination department. There seems to be something wrong with our imagination levels. Hmm. Did you try the bypass key? Yes. Did you try turning it off and turning it back on again? Yes. Well, we've been getting an unusual amount of calls today for some reason. What happened? It looks like tech support is having technical difficulties. Great. What are we going to do now? Oh, no. The emergency buzzer won't stop. Uh, no. Oh, we have a situation. What is it? Is it the popsicle meter? I thought we fixed that last time. It's definitely not the popsicle meter. It's the main frame. Sydney. It seems... Sydney has flatlined her imagination scape. This isolation from her friends has really done her in. But we were managing. She's got her little brother, her parents. Well, according to my calculations, she's been in isolation for mm, 97 days now. 97? That's like a million hours. Well, 2,328 to be exact. Let me look at my chart. Well, actually, Minus sleeping hours, it's more like 1,455 hours. But we were managing so well. What with uh, building forts and making up games, dance parties, and the ground is lava. It's so effective boredom that I, I didn't even notice the drop. Exactly. The drop. Now, if this keeps up and, and, and Sydney's imagination sparks don't rise, we might lose power altogether and then... Exactly. No imagination. We might lose our jobs. 
And and Sippy might not recover, and then what? Oh, okay, um, I'm gonna check the raw data from the other departments. Um, maybe the issue is just us. Okay, so it looks like all chemical and architectural environments are clear, but incubation is at a lowered speed. We're synergizing, but at a reduced capacity. Oh, and you were right. There is a block in the flexibly integrated structure of the dynamic mental workspace, disabling conscious manipulation to the widespread neutral network. Okay, in other words, in other words, all departments are on a squirrel train to Sleepy Town and in danger of stopping altogether. Well, we've got to contact the other departments. If they're slowing down too, then this might be a wider spread issue. Oh, gee. This is hard work. I'm getting tired. Me too. It's a symptom of the Imagination Factory slowing down. We've got to hurry. Call the creative space. Calling creative space. It's Herb. Herb, how are things down at the creative space? What's been happening? We can't hear you, Herb. Can you hear us? I think he's muted. Herb, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Herb, you have to check your settings. Um, Herb, is there anyone down at the creative space who can help you? Oh, this could take a while. Herb is new and I think he came from the analog department, so technology is not really in his wheelhouse. You know, if only Sydney could visit one friend in person. I think that would jump the levels enough until we could find a solution. I can't believe she hasn't even seen Taryn, her best friend. Just through FaceTime, Taryn's parent is working full time and homeschooling them. So they don't have time to coordinate a safely distanced visit. But she needs Taryn. Those two always spark each other's imagination when things get tough. It could save us all. Okay, calm down. We can't help Sydney if we freak out. We need to remain calm and so we can find a solution. Okay, you're right. You're right. Let me just... Okay, what are our next steps? Well, we could um, keep going with the temporary measures and try to stem the drop's trajectory, or we could try to jump the levels. We need support. Try calling tech support again. Oh no, we lost tech support altogether. They're offline. Uh, we're gonna have to run things on analog for now. Let's try another popsicle test and see where we're at. Popsicle test begins. Uh, it's not working. Well, try again. I can't. I'm too sleepy. Oh. Can't we just hack into Sydney's memory and replay something from her imagination logs? Maybe I don't get something going. Yeah, let me just. Is it going? Oh, yes, I see something. Oh, it looks connected to the stream of consciousness, too. This is a story about the ocean and what's underneath the ocean. And not just the fish and sea life, but oh, hey, there are no cats in this story. Maybe I'll put a cat in later. Okay, well, anyway, this story is about the people who live under the ocean and the houses that they live in. One person in particular, a little girl, 
she would go out every night to see the reflection of the moon in the water. She really wanted to see the moon in the sky. So she got a ladder and climbed onto her house. But it wasn't high enough. So she got out her ladder onto a passing boat. She sailed that boat to the shore. And when she got there, she took her ladder and leaned it against the sky. And she climbed up using the stars to lean her ladder on. She climbed and climbed until she reached the moon. It was so big. And she was so small. But she got off her ladder and walked on the moon's face. Then she said goodbye and went home again. Copyright Sydney, 2019. nominal increase and I feel a little extra energized. Yeah, that little bit helped. But for how long? Hmm. We've got to get some help on this. Um, is anything coming in from Herb at the creative space? Herb, are you there? Can you log on? Okay, so you're saying the creative space is at a halt. Oh no, Herb, you're muted again. Can you hear us? Oh, it's frozen. Uh, you're frozen, Herb. Okay, uh, this isn't going to work. He's obviously having a hard time connecting. You can say that again. Join the club. But I did catch that he said the creative space is at a halt and isn't generating anything right now. Well, we can't do anything without the creative space running. Wait a minute. I'm getting a call. Hello? Oh, it's the science department. Greetings, Imagination Factory. Salutations from the science lab. Hello. Welcome, Dr. T and Dr. Fee. What brings you to the Imagination Emergency Call? Yeah, how did you hear about our emergency? Are you here to help? Do you have a solution? Hear about it. We are living it. The science lab is at peak boredom levels at the moment. The breaker routine was good at first, but the homeschooling, the endless baking. How long can we observe the cat sleeping in the box? We get it. Cats love boxes. You can read all about it on our blog, but to put it simply, the science department is stuck. We've plateaued. We've hit the limit. Sydney just doesn't have the imagination levels to keep her science resources supplied with interest and inspiration. We need the imagination factory running efficiently. Or, or, Now let's think logically. Let's not let our fears run away with us. You're right. I couldn't even anyway. I don't have the imagination to imagine what would happen without imagination. Oh, but we do have the data. And the data does not look good. But maybe if we can look at the numbers a little differently. Oh, this is terrible. If even the science department can't help us, we're lost. Mm, I can feel the sleepiness taking over. 
please hurry. I think you're using all of the imagination reserves to rethink the data, and it's making us slower and more tired. The data, Eureka. Oh, uh, oh my goodness, of course, the data. Great idea. We should find out what Dr. Doris has to say on this matter. Who is Dr. Doris? Only the foremost researcher on the subject of severe boredom and the decreasing levels of the imagination sparks on the level meter. Great, let's ask her. Yes, if anyone has any idea, it's got to be her. Oh, yes. In fact, she wrote the book on it. So, should we give her a call or something? Oh, no. Dr. Doris is very busy, and why would we call her when everything we need to know is in this book? Chapter 1. So your levels have dropped. A guide to sparkifying your entry-level grid lines to force access points in your express lane to exhibit signs of clouds and sunlight in balanced measures. When you are dealing with remote servers and tennis elbow coordination, you'll see that operational structures lead to fantastical leaks in the art base of the deco frame. What's happening? Jojo? 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 Ellie? What's happened to you? I don't know. I think I'm made of paper. Well, let's get out of here then. Okay. Where are we? I don't know. What are we? I think we're made of shadows. I think we're both made of shadows. all that we did was take a nap too. Oh, well, I'm glad we napped. I, I feel more rested. Yeah, me too. I'll check the levels. <laughs> Yay! Holding steady. Hmm. What should we do now? Should we try a popsicle test? Sure, yeah. Let's do a popsicle test. Okay. Popsicle test, begin. Sticky. Gooey. Mm, cheery. Cheery. Normal. Come on. Yeah.
Wow, that was amazing. Uh, some of the best theater I see is at the children's venue. The creativity and... Oh, oh totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Incredibly creative um, and very enjoying. Yeah, like we had comments throughout the whole thing. Amazing use of props. Uh, there we go. They're using Definitely. the props beautifully, for sure, for sure. The use of props is making me very happy. Excellent, Aaron. Excellent. Looking, yeah, yeah, so am I, knock on wood, knock on wood. So, uh, we're actually very lucky to have Echo Theatre here and the co-creators Jen and Charlene and possibly a special guest with us. What? Hi. Hello. Hey, Hi. Who's hey, our special everybody. guest? This is Phoebe. Hi, Phoebe. Hey, Phoebe. <laughs> hey, Phoebe. So how are you guys doing? Good. Really good. It's so exciting to be here. And has this been the first time that Echo Theatre has done work for children, or is this a recent shift? Uh, uh, we have done uh, kids' shows before. We did um, oh. an original show I wrote oh, many years ago now called The Misadventurous Perils of Pauline. And um, we did a kids' show for um, Mammoth Fest for the Master Playwright Festival uh, called The Poet and the Rent that uh, Jen and I were both in. Yes. And, oh, and I uh, just was reminded we, were all, we also did The Twits, Roald Dahl's The Twits. Um, that was even longer ago. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, right and on, right on. and what, what's uh, the differences uh, between getting ready to do a live show at the Fringe and doing a virtual show for us now? Um, it was really different, but it was like Charlene was in her home the whole time. I was in my home the whole time. So um, it was sort of a lot more isolated than it would normally be, but it oddly felt like we were really putting on a theater show as it started to roll around doing tech, waiting in a green room, um, just all those little pieces and having our studio set up in our homes. Um, it was really different, but also really felt like theater. So it was great. Yeah, I got, I got similar uh, butterflies going into tonight. I was getting very nervous. Yeah. Yeah, I was the same way last night for opening. I don't think I've ever been as nervous on an opening. I know. <laughs> How about you? Yeah, for sure. Even right now, just sitting here nervous watching you, but I really enjoy the new content and just having it virtual. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun to do. It was a fun challenge. The show yeah. looked amazing. Uh, we absolutely can't wait for 2021. Uh, throughout the comments, we have people loving Herb. They want to know what's up with Herb. So Herb got a huge fan club online. Poor Herb. Uh, so we need you guys to come back with Herb in 2021. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, Thanks so take much. Care. Take care. Take Thanks care. for having us. And Herb will be back. For sure. <laughs> right on. Thanks, Thanks Echo guys. Theater. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Charlene. All right. Uh, before we move on, uh, I would like to say thank you to all our government funders and our donors. And uh, we are already getting ready for 2021. So if you feel like supporting us, please go to winnipegfringe.com. Support the Fringe Donate. The screen is not mirrored, so I don't know. There is, yes, it's there. Uh, support the Fringe. Donate now. Make a charitable donation. And we appreciate it very much. What's next? Who do we have joining us next? Well, our next act is called Powers, and it was created by Ryan Adam Wells. It's, uh, and he's a great story teller, so off to you, Ryan. Ryan, a man with long brown hair and a full beard, sits at the foot of a bright white bed with white and gray blankets, holding an acoustic guitar. Around his neck is a metal harmonica halo, and he's wearing a superhero t-shirt. You're up to you, Ryan. Hello, Winnipeg. Ryan Adam Wells here. Uh, you may have seen me in the past as part of Sound and Fury or with my shows Beers About Songs and The 500 List. What I've brought for you tonight is a selection of music from the new show that I'm currently writing. It's called Powers. It's about my lifelong love of superheroes and science fiction. 
and also my lifelong struggles with depression and anxiety and PTSD. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm going to give you guys a selection of the songs tonight, so I hope you really enjoy them. I'm actually going to debut uh, a new song at the end, too. So thanks for being here, and without further ado, uh, this is the music from Powers. Life ain't easy for a good three boy. Life ain't easy for a good three boy. Life ain't easy for a good three boy. Life ain't easy. Life ain't easy. Mama done the best with us kids. Mama done the best with us kids. Mama done the best with us kids. Mama done the best. She done the best. Daddy died down in the coal mine. Daddy died down in the coal mine. Daddy died down in the coal mine. Down, down in the mine. You can't hurt me when I'm blasting. You can't hurt me when I'm blasting. You can't hurt me when I'm blasting. When I'm blasting, then I'm free. Now life ain't easy for a good three boy. Life ain't easy for a good three boy. Life ain't easy for a good three boy. Life ain't easy. Life ain't easy. <laughs> And I learned how to sweat in the field of Kentucky. We worked hard enough to make up for the fact that we weren't lucky. The honey was good, even when it was bad. And when those hard times came down like a cannonball, like a cannonball. Like a cannonball, we stood them all. Well, the summer turned to autumn, and my father closed down the mine. Now there's blood in the water Down by where my brother learned how to fly Well, my mother gave up everything My sister shed her skin And I tried to turn to steel That's not the nature of my gift Oh, I'm no good Lord, it got bad When those hard times came down like a cannonball, like a cannonball, like a cannonball. Oh, we stood them all. I'm learning all these lessons holding tight to my roots. Daddy always said be good. Because son, there's too much of the bad. So when those hard times come down, I'll be a cannonball. I'll be a cannonball. Lord, I'll be a cannonball. Cannonball. Hello, Lord. 
This next song, uh, I wanted to write the world's nerdiest love song. Uh, being a massive nerd myself and a huge fan of comic books and science, I think I have achieved that. So this is my nerdy love song. I call this Darwin. the fire in your pocket when you want to start a fight if you're ready to cool down well then i'll become some ice i'll be fuel for your rocket or the rocket failing that anything you ever need from me i'll adapt so you want to get a bill passed well then i'll become the senate if you start to catch a cold i'll turn into triamedic or the aspirin for your headache or the pillow for your nap. Whatever you decide you need from me, baby, I'll adapt. Say who I am. Well, I'll become a wahoo for you. They say that no man is an island. Well, I can rearrange my molecules, so that's no longer true. Oh, you want to look real pretty? Well, I'll be ten diamond rings. You want to fly around the city? I'll become a pair of wings, or a traffic helicopter, or a super cool jetpack. I'll figure out a way to get you high. Baby, I'll adapt. I'll be your mansion in the Hamptons or your cozy little shack. Whatever you decide you need from me, oh, I'll adapt, I'll adapt, I'll adapt. Uh, this next song is about a rather obscure character from Marvel Comics who is a, uh, a mutant from the X-Men, whose ability uh, is to heal. Uh, he was also born with a star in his brain. Uh, and I found that worked very well as a metaphor for a lot of the things that I think and feel about the world. So this is a little story song called Zorn. <laughs> small Chinese town in a hole in the ground in an armored cell flanked by guards sat a man draped in chains with a star for a brain and a mask of cast iron on his heart he'd been tortured and burned Still no one had learned anything more than his name. Still this man held in binds with a steelless steel mind. He forgave them all every day. And he said, there will be healing. All 
things must come to an end. There will be healing at the house down the street. Lived a family of three with a young girl with a hole in her lung. They tried every elixir. Oh no, nothing could fix her. As it worsened, they feared she'd succumb. And they heard of a rumor of a guard's healed tumor from the man with a star in his head. And her father, he sold off all that they owned when he heard what that man always said. There will be healing. All things must come to an end, there will be healing. And they brought her to see him, and he sighed as she came in. For he could feel her pain as she gasped. He could sense her confusion at the steam from the fusion that flowed through the slits in his mask. He effortlessly moved his hands from the binds, brought her in close. And she held him tight. Then she smiled, and the guards took her away. And the man put his hands back in place. And now an old woman, she sits on her porch, and she knits. And daydreams of times long gone by. The man was freed at long last by a girl made of glass and a man who shot sun from his eyes. She smiled wistfully when she heard he'd broke free and silently offered up thanks. And she'll always remember how his face smoked like embers, the man with a star for a brain, who said there will be healing, all things must come to an end, there will be healing, oh, must come to an end. There will be he he healing. So every one of these nerd songs, these are all story songs that I've written uh, that are also secretly metaphors for things that I have gone through, uh, even though they are not completely autobiographical. Uh, this song is no exception. This is about a World War II era superhero named the Human Torch, uh, and it's called Of a Human Torch, and I hope you like it. And I opened up my eyes, 
and I saw fire. And oh, the flames, they were not hot to touch. And immediately I was filled with desire to know so much. And I closed my eyes and the fire went out. The next few weeks I was kept underground. Just a glimmer of my taste of air, an image of the world out there, and dreams of so much more to learn about. Well, eventually I slipped out through the cracks. I found myself a home and a name. No one ever tried to put me back. In fact, I even found a taste of fame. Oh, the water ebb, the water flow. Oh, the friends would come, the friends would go. Oh, they loved me whenever trouble came. When it had gone, they feared my flame, but not her. To her I was like gold. Oh, my Laura. She loved me like gold. Can we burn? We burn. We burn. We burn. We burned up hot and bright. Well, I met my Laura on a Scottish beach. She was drowning, and I helped her to land. We stood there as her beauty froze my speech. She kept my feet from burning on the sand. She tested me and often I'd see red. She always turned my rage to joy instead. Like that time, climbing up the hill, I moved to fly. She stood still and pulled me back and coolly kissed my head. We walked slowly, sweating, dreaming of our bed. Where we burn, we burn, we burn, we burn, we burn up hot and bright. could get me to settle down. Whenever I was gone, she feared the worst. She always said she's sure that she'd die of a broken heart. Well, the cancer took her first. And I opened up my eyes and I saw fire. The flames this time, they cut me like a briar. Oh, they grew and would not dissipate. And so I died far away, praying soon to find myself beside her. Praying soon, let me find myself beside her, and I burn, I burn, I burn, I burn, Lord, I burned up hot and bright. That song's called I'll Be Human Torch. Listen to me today, folks, uh, and thanks for coming on the Winnipeg Fringe stream. There's a lot of great stuff after me, so don't go anywhere. I have one more kind of quick song, and this is a debut. Um, this is a new song that I've written for this show, so some of my uh, longtime viewers and fans will be pleased to hear this. Uh, this is called Superhuman, and thank you so much for hanging out with me. When it all gets too much, can't find your light You can't lift your head You 
your arms up to fight Feels like the world doesn't want you You can't find your home And no matter who's with you You're always alone When that unwelcome darkness is always around and the noise in your head threatens to tear you down when you feel the scream building from deep in your lungs take a breath the breath always comes and say i am not broken i am not broken i am not broken no no I am superhuman. Every hero has villains and a weakness or two and a pain that they carry through all that they do. And every villain has heroes who push them toward the light. And they inch ever close with every lost fight. And the nightmares and terrors of this modern age may hover above us as we start to wake. We'll scream to the gods of the air, or oh, whatever's up there. You may bend us, but we'll never break. Because I am not broken. I am not broken. I am not broken. No, no. I am superhuman. Oh, hatred and fear and anxiety will turn to dust the clap of our hands. And we'll build this world of unity. The love is the law of the land. We are not broken. We are not broken. We are not broken. No, no. Oh, no, no, no. We are not broken. We are not broken. We are not broken. No, no. We are superhuman. Thanks, guys. Wonderful performance, Ryan. Thank you so much. And I want to say a big thank you out to our sponsor, the Exchange Biz, as well. Yeah, the Exchange Biz has been us for years. We're usually out in the Exchange District in the beer tent or the patio listening to live music. Uh, so this was a nice shout out to, to just be chilling out here and listening to Ryan. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder, stay active online. Give us a like, give us a hello. All these messages have, have been great. We love doing virtually yes. yours online. And just so you know, when you do comment or when you do send an emoji or when you do like or love or care, you get automatically entered to win this amazing, oh, it's not on camera anymore, it, amazing custom-made cooler, a custom-made Winnipeg Fringe cooler, and we also have a $100 gift certificate to the Liquor Marts. You can claim those prizes in Winnipeg, and uh, we also have a prize that you can claim anywhere in the world. It's a 2021 Super Pass for Fringe next year, knock on wood, fingers crossed, we'll be there, and if you win a Super Pass, you can be there too, watching all the shows. Now, uh, we have some very special guests with us coming live uh, from a remote location. These are probably the coolest people on the Fringe staff. We have our men and women who are usually dressed in black actually wearing colors. Amazing. Hello, Tex. Hi, Ray. Hi, Ray. Hey, hey, hey. All you guys are chilling at a pool party. How are things going? Just like a normal Fringe, sitting around drinking beer and talking more stories. <laughs> Normal friends sitting around drinking beer. Perfect, <laughs> perfect. Uh, we miss you guys. So what do you miss about the Fringe? 
<laughs> You're a few in, aren't you? That's fantastic. Happy birthday, Carrie. I hear it's Carrie's birthday. Is Carrie on camera? Yes, happy birthday, Carrie. We miss you. You probably would be having like some crazy ice cream right now with some El Himidors, but unfortunately we can't, so I have a couple there. Hey, Steve. Hey, Karen. Hey, Sean. How are you guys? Much love. We miss you. Can't wait for 2021. Shout out to our techs. Everybody online, send a like, send a love, send a hello to our great techs. We miss you guys so much. Oh, pardon me, sorry. Natara is here too. She zoomed in. Hey, Natara, what's up? How you doing? Oh, there I see you on the in front of the barbecue. We miss you all. We miss you all. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you in 2021. Yes? No? Oh, goodness. They're cut off. They're cut off and we'll cut them off. Thank you very much. Thank you to the tax. Please send your love. And don't forget, when you do send your love, we will enter you into our prize draw. So... Uh, I'm very excited for our, our, our next guest because she, like me, is an alumni of the University of Manitoba and the Black Hole Theatre Company. So shout out to that company. Who do we got? So our next in line, you know, is I'm Not Taylor Swift by Anjali Sandhu. And she's from right here in Winnipeg. She's back and she's still not Taylor Swift. A short video starts the performance featuring still photos of Anjali intercut with a vintage black and white film reel counting down from five. Anjali is a South Asian woman with long dark brown hair. She stands 5'8 and wears a blue and yellow cheerleader outfit resembling that of Taylor Swift in her video for Shake It Off. Look better on Taylor. On stage, there is a sparkly light pink stool set behind a mic stand with a sparkly pink microphone. Back to you, Angeli. Okay, we are back. We're having a bit of tech difficulties. Uh, maybe we should bring the techs back and we shouldn't have cut them off. Oh, well, too late. They can't be with us. Come back. Come back. <laughs> uh, maybe we will bring the techs back if they want to join us. No problem. Why don't you tell us about your experience uh, with Shakespeare Fest and Hamlet and uh, how it was performing in that small venue, the Down the Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was certainly different. Um, you know, it was a different though in a really great way because Hello? the smaller the venue it was. And if it doesn't work, I'm still getting paid. I had to kind paid, of really so hone into Hamlet's work good. and do Thank you all so much for being here. Well. Like everyone uh, watching at home, you, you know, are this, true so. fans. With but the people who came out tonight. Process, it was really challenging, you know, just because of the text of Shakespeare is quite, you know, tricky, right? So I was just thinking my brain actually turned to jelly while I was trying to do the translation. Yeah. But I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. And, you know, there was some, you know, tech involved there too. So that helped kind of, you know, brighten up my performance. It was a fantastic experience. You know, being able to interact with the audience and have that kind of feedback and the exposure was, was incredible in the venue. So in terms of Shakespeare, you know, when I you think about the English and, and then trying to put it into American Sign Language, just that work of the translation and making it visual and making it live. Yeah, yeah. And how would you like performing with an audience who was like maybe only six feet away and right there with you the whole time? How's that experience? Oh, you know, I would say it was certainly more intimate and you, I really enjoyed being there with the audience. 
seeing their expression, how they were, you know, gripping the, the scene. And really, it actually fed my energy while I was performing and gave me more of a motivation, you know, versus like a huge venue, you know, where you kind of just see faces, you can't see anything, and the lights are so bright that you can't see the audience. I kind of felt like I was really able to connect with them. And I would say it was probably one of the most experiences I've had. Awesome, awesome. Well, I think we got the, we got the tech going, yes? I got the thumbs up. So let's go back outside to Anjali Sandu. Okay. Great. We're good? Perfect. Okay. See, it's very distracting because there's a screen being played for the live audience with me there. And like my eye just wants to be like, oh, my hair okay? Yes, of course. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I am so excited to be doing Virtual Fringe, especially because tonight all the proceeds I made from this show are going towards helping a child bride to have the wedding of her dreams. I'm allowed to make that joke. My grandmother was a child bride. Um, she was married off by the time she was 15. I should mention that my grandpa was 16, so it was less horrific abuse and more MTV 16 and pregnant. Um, but, you know, my grandma, she will be disappointed in me every now and then. She'll say things like, when I was your age, I was married with two kids. I'm like, okay, you also don't know how to read, so. If I had to choose between literacy and a man, I, mm. I'd probably find out if the man knew how to read, because both of us don't need to. I have a lot of resentment towards my grandma. And that's because when I was little, all I wanted to do was ballet. Like, I wanted to be in a tutu on stage, but she said, no, you're brown. You're going to do a brown person dance. So I had to do something called Barth Natyam. And I would actually, funny story, come to this gas station theater every year in full Indian clothes, just so resentful because this is the ugliest dance in the world. So you start off like this, and this isn't bad, it's almost like a plie, um, but then you put your arms like this. <laughs> Internet. Internet people, can you hear me? Russian bots, please send a sign if the internet people can hear me or not. I need, uh, if I have to do my set like this, this, I need to be paid more. I'm not, thank you. Okay, well, I guess we're gonna roll with the punches. Um, and so, okay, so they, imagine my arms are like this. Uh, and then from here, you just proceed to repeatedly kick yourself in the vagina. So. And this dance was very important to my grandmother because back then, abortions were not legal and they had to deal with the teen pregnancies in some way. Yes. So that was first step of Barth Natyam. I'm gonna show you second step, okay? This is in case it's twins. And now I'm going to show you third step. Let me see if I can remember it. I, I just saved you all a trip to Folkorama, so you're welcome. <laughs> Sir, I am wearing bicycle shorts, so it's fine. Please don't feel violated. <laughs> this mic, it works, but it's not pink. Is the trade-off worth it? I don't know. I live in an awkward place where I'm not pretty enough to just get by on my looks, but I'm also not ugly enough that people feel bad for me. 
I told that joke once. And after the show, this really sweet lady came up to me and she was like, you know what? You are very funny. And you know what else? You are very pretty. And I was like, oh my God, I am ugly enough that people feel bad for me. And you know how I know I'm ugly? It's because I signed up for online dating and I wrote the most basic bio. I was like, fun, outgoing Hindu who loves spending time with friends and family. And I got nothing. You know, whatever, fuck you, christianmingle.com. Sick of it. I often find myself really enjoying things that clearly were not meant for me. Like right now, my favorite song is Cowboy Take Me Away by the Dixie Chicks. And I know that a cowboy is not going to come in on a horse and sweep me off my feet. Okay, I'm aware that I'm not Taylor Swift. If a cowboy is coming to take me away, it's because he wants me out of his country and back in Pakistan where I belong. I'm not Pakistani, but cowboys don't know the difference between Pakistan and India. <laughs> I don't even know the difference between Pakistan and India. I mean, it's... Russian bots, if you are picking up on that motorcycle noise, please send me a sign. Horrible. Horrible. As I was saying, cowboys do not know the difference between Pakistan and India. And I don't even know the difference between Pakistan and India. Everything I know about my own culture, I learned from Julia Roberts in the film Eat, Pray, Love. And I don't understand why Indian women get mad at white girls for wearing bindis when the bindi was invented by Gwen Stefani in the early 90s. Does anyone here have siblings? Who? Yes. My sister is clapping. No shit. Do you have any siblings? Are you like the oldest, youngest, middle? You are the oldest. Thank you for understanding my plight. How much do you hate your youngest siblings? She doesn't. She is a liar. And you will be exposed by the Russian bots one day. I am the oldest of three girls. So kind of like the Kardashians. But if Chris has, had raised them right. Um, and being the oldest, you'll know this. You go through life not being able to do anything only to find out your youngest sibling can do whatever the hell they want. My sister is 19 years old, openly gay, living in Montreal alone, attending theater school, and my mother could not be more proud. This is the same woman who forced me to go to law school and told me I wasn't allowed to wear tampons until after marriage. After my sister hold, heard that joke, she said to my mom, did you tell Angelie she couldn't wear tampons until after marriage? And my mom admitted it. She was like, you know what? It was a different time. It was 2004. Yeah, really. My mom found marijuana amongst my sister's belongings. Do you know what she said? She said, it's fine. You know what? It's legal now. It's better for you than smoking. This is the same woman who found tampons amongst my belongings and told me that they were the devil's tea bags. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you what she said about the diva cup. <laughs> the devil shot glass. Horrible. And that's just my mom. We had to tell my grandmother, my Indian grandmother, that my sister, you know, she came out to my grandma. And my grandma was actually very supportive, um, but she had a lot of questions. So we were watching TV one day and she said, Did you know that uh, Ellen is lesbian? I'm like, which one? Paige or DeGeneres? Ellen DeGeneres is lesbian too? I don't want your sister to marry Ellen DeGeneres. I'm like, Grandma, the risk of that happening is very low. 
She's like, good. I want her to marry a nice Indian girl like Kim Kardashian. Grandma, you do know that Kim Kardashian is not Indian, right? What? I don't like it anymore. Um, and my grandma's questions just got progressively worse. She was like, okay, but tell me something, okay? Tell me something. What about, uh, what about, uh, okay, let me wait for the, let me wait for this drama. I'm just waiting for the fire truck to end its drama. I am doing a show here. Your fire can wait. How dare they? Anyway, back to my grandmother's question. She said to me, okay, let me, let me ask you a question, okay? Come here. Tell me, what, what about, uh, you know, what about, uh, what about God? I'm like, oh my God, thank God. <sighs> Who the hell points with two fingers? Grandma, it's fine, okay? God loves lesbians. Um, I think God loves all people. We, we will see about that. I, um, I wanna do something now that literally every person told me not to. This is a segment that I like to call Feed the Trolls. So when I found out that I was gonna do online fringe, I was terrified of the internet people and the mean comments they would say about me. Um, so I'm just gonna read the mean comments together live. I think this is a great idea because someone great once said, the haters gonna hate, 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 hate. It's an ambulance now, guys. Wait till the show is over. Haters, speaking of which, they're gonna hate, 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 but baby, I'm just gonna cry myself to sleep tonight, probably. So we're gonna see what the haters are saying, okay? I'm not gonna expose everyone. So there's a live stream on YouTube and one on Facebook, and I'm gonna check one of them out. I'm not gonna say any names uh, for liability reasons. Uh, so this first person said, Taylor Swift's show is better. This show is also free. So I don't know, maybe like drop me 20 mil and maybe I'll try and step up the game to your standards. That wasn't so bad, okay. The next one just says, fat. Bitch, where? <laughs> where though? Also, all body types are beautiful. That's not an insult. So I win this comment too. Okay, this one is like, I don't know if someone's just trying to like play the game, but this one is really mean. Um, it says, fuck you, you are a piece of shit, go home. You know what, I am gonna expose this person. I don't care, sue me. Um, this person is literally 11 years old. Okay, great, on that note. Um, sorry, are you guys getting bitten by mosquitoes? No, but this one lady's like, no, it's just you and you deserve it. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually just got bit in the middle of the forehead w w by a mosquito, and I'm pretty sure it's racially motivated. <laughs> uh, one thing I'm tired of, and I'm sure you guys are tired of it too, is racism, racist people. I'm sick of it. I'm at a point where I would be happy if every racist person just died. Like, I wouldn't kill them. I'm not telling you people to kill. Russian bots stand down. We're not gonna kill anyone, but imagine if we just woke up one morning and all the racist people had just died in their sleep of natural causes. Those would be the most, okay, yeah, yes. Applause for death. We like it. That is what I'm trying to bring to the world. Um, but those would be the most awkward funerals ever. Everyone would be like, we are here today because Aunt Karen lived. She is now in hell, thank you. I'm so scared of the internet people now. They are going to go off. Um, but I'm also low-key afraid that if that happened, there would only be like eight people left when we woke up. Like it would be me, Oprah, the Obamas. Are you racist, sir? No, are you racist, ma'am? 
I've never seen people answer a question more quickly. I was like, are you racist? She said, no, no. I'm proud of that response. Um, so yeah, it'd be me, Obama, all the Obamas, Oprah, and these two people. Everyone else is dead. I, uh, can you imagine if Oprah died? Everyone would be like, holy shit, Oprah was a racist. Yeah, she didn't like Japanese people. What? Why? Connie Chung was her mortal enemy. Connie Chung is Chinese. I know, that's why Oprah was racist. Yeah, she also didn't like Indian people. What? Why? She once rode in a Duffy's taxi. That, okay, that's, that's still not a good thing, but okay. Yeah, and guess what? Oprah also didn't like white people. What? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. There's no such thing as racism against white people. I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding, but there are a lot of white people here and I'm scared. I'm doing a super intense acting class right now. And one of my assignments was to meditate. And while doing so, ask a question to the universe. Um, and let yourself get the wisdom of the universe and the strength of the universe. So the question I decided to ask the universe was, what funny new joke should I tell Fringe tomorrow? And so I sat there for 20 minutes meditating on it. I had my notepad and pencil. And once the 20 minutes was over, all I had written down was farts. So obviously I wasn't satisfied with this universe advice. So I wrote to the universe's manager. I said, dear God, I wasn't happy with this advice. Can you help me out? And God wrote back and he was like, actually, I don't manage the universe anymore. Uh, Satan has taken over. P.S. I only love lesbians. I was like, fair, fair. Um, so I made an appointment with Satan. I went down to hell for our meeting and he was very hospitable. He, uh, before the meeting started, he was like, Angeli, do you need anything? Can I get you anything? Water, tea, a shot? And I said, absolutely not. Because <laughs> my mom told me what you make that with. <laughs> and I am absolutely not interested. And Satan told me some scary, some scary news. He was like, Angeli, things aren't looking good for you. You're probably gonna end up down here. And I was like, well, what did I do? He said, Angeli, it says here that you, uh, you made jokes about child brides. That's horrible. You know, there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. That was a Taylor Swift quote. Clearly none of you are true fans. <laughs> then he said, it said you made tasteless jokes about abortion and tampons. I'm like, that's fair, I did do that. You know what, that's fine. Then he said, finally, it says here that you were racist against white people. And I said, no, 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 no. There is no such thing as being a racist against white people. And he said, I know, but there are a lot of white people here. And I'm scared. Thank you guys so much. You've been awesome. Thank you, Anjali. That was amazing. That was amazing. Uh, just a reminder that uh, in Fringe, performers get 100% of the box office. And uh, we absolutely thank our funders and our donors, and we thank you guys for helping us at winnipegfringe.com and giving us charitable donations. Uh, with that, we can't put on a festival. We can't give the artists 100% of the proceeds. So check out our website, winnipegfringe.com. There it is. Check it. Donate now. Help us out. And don't forget to still be alive out there on, uh, on, on the virtual side of things. Give us a like. Give us a comment. And you will be entered into our amazing grand 
prizes. And I'd also like to thank uh, ACU, Assembly Credit Union, for being an incredible sponsor. Without them, we couldn't put on this live event and we can pay our performers for being here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Assiniboine Credit Union, and thank you, University of Winnipeg, for your support with all this great technical uh, equipment. Again, without you guys, we couldn't have it done. Yeah, and a big thank you to Winnipeg Fringe Festival. And of course, with Jamie, Saz, Bree, Teresa, and all you, you volunteers, I think we'd like to go ahead and show the video now of all the volunteers, so take it away. people those volunteers are they only the volunteers? hey again everybody hey hey so uh i think we're ready for for our next group a group that you are closely connected to as, as you've worked with them uh, before previously yep i used to work with them we do an annual event called les mis a uh, group with uh, different performers cabaret and uh andrea von wicker i've also performed with her before and she will be performing next in our thing called by, sorry, by Sick and Twisted, Trigger Warning, Contagion. Written and performed by Andre. You're live. Andrea is a white woman with short brown hair, wearing red coveralls with short rolled up sleeves. She sits outside in a grass clearing. She is surrounded by trees and the river flows behind her. The sun will make its journey into night throughout the course of this performance. Andrea. Andrea. Dies ire, dies illa, solvet se he plum in fa villa, teste da li cum cibilla. When the global pandemic was declared, I had just finished writing a last minute grant proposal for a bring your own venue show at the Winnipeg 2020 Fringe Festival, not this show. I uh, had also just been officially off CPP disability for 18 days, having gone back to full-time work in October after four years of living on disability, uh, an experience which was uh, dehumanizing, debilitating, depressing, and very demoralizing. And while the entire globe was plunged into pandemic crisis, I was having the best spring in 10 years, not plagued by thoughts that the only thing I could accomplish in life would be my suicide. At the beginning, of the global shutdown when everyone stayed home. People were super enthusiastic. They're gonna get fit and super ripped and they're gonna bake so much bread and they're gonna read books and learn a language. And three weeks later, we hear the rumblings of, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I, I can't get out of bed and I, I can't get dressed and I, I'm staying in my pajamas and I can't get a schedule and I have all of this nameless free floating anxiety and I'm not really sure why. I, I don't like being at home. I don't like not being able to leave. So my hope is that that pandemic might plant the seeds of empathy in us for all those people disabled or mentally ill or otherwise who actually can't leave their homes, who can't participate in our regular capitalist economy. Winnipeg has been relatively unscathed by COVID-19 and it's our relative geographical isolation that we have to thank for this. If you drive six hours any direction from Winnipeg, you will find yourself in the middle of fucking nowhere. But this geographic isolation has also produ produced a small 
degree of complacency. Uh, a few months ago, going out in public, grocery store, what have you, it was shocking to see how few people were wearing masks, how few people were social distancing. In fact, the safest I felt this summer was at the Justice for Black Lives Winnipeg rally, where everyone almost was wearing a mask. And you should give them money. It's Justice for the number four, Black Lives Winnipeg at gmail.com. They will accept your e-transfer right now. So just to put this in context for people in Manitoba who may not have really felt the full impact like a city like Milan, for example, or New York will have, is that Manitoba, as of today, has a total of, has had a total of 335 cases of COVID-19. So that is the audience for one performance, plus all the people who couldn't get tickets, of a super popular show at the Warehouse Theatre at the Winnipeg Fringe Festival. That's all. Only seven people have died, and really, that's a dinner party, or it's the board of directors of a small arts organization. It's really not a lot of people, and unfortunately, most of us won't know them. Now, if we go wider and look at Canada, Canada has had something like 108,000 plus a couple hundred cases. So the Blue Bombers estimate that there are 20,000 football fans at every home game. So Canada has had a total of five football stadiums full of people being ill. And our death toll is almost at 9,000 now. So you would have to imagine half to three quarters of all the seats at the Bell MTS Center filled with cadavers. Globally, 5,000 people a day approximately and on average are dying. So in order to get a sense of that, if you put dead bodies in every seat at the Winnipeg Centennial Concert Hall twice. That is the pile of human bodies dying every day from coronavirus. And globally, over half a million people have died. And that is 20 full football stadiums. It's a lot of death. And it ain't over yet. There are between one and 10 billion microbes in every single gram of soil. Uh, microorganisms are the oldest form of life on this planet. And in fact, they are responsible for transforming it from a volcanic wasteland into this verdant, green place full of vegetation, creating an atmosphere that's capable of sustaining your and my life. If there is a God, it is the trillions and trillions of bacteria working in tandem to create this place for us to exist. Now, a virus is a particular type of microbe and like a seed, it's not particularly in and of itself living. It's a few molecules with a bit of genetic code inside covered with a protein shell. And the protein shell is what the soap, if you wash your hands, it'll dissolve that, that shell. And then the genetic material just goes yeah, and, and the virus is rendered uh, ineffective. But if a virus enters a host cell, it begins the process of using the cell's internal machinery to re replicate itself. And as it does that, it continually begins to add little pieces of its host's genetic material to its own protein shell, which is why viruses are constantly mutating. And so far, research at the, researchers at the U of M have discovered 167 different mutations of the coronavirus since the world has gone down on lockdown. Amazing. Most of our genetic material has been deposited in us over time by viruses. The word contagion comes from two Latin words. The first being con, which means 
with or, or together. And the second is tangere, which means touching. So with, together, touching. And, and I can't think of anything that captures the essence of being a primate more simply. And contagion can refer to a couple of things. It, it's the process by which a disease will travel from one body to another. It can also refer to a particular plague or pestilence. Uh, and it is also the contaminating agent. Now, in Western culture, in English, about 1500s, mid 1500s, we introduce another meaning of contagion. And it's a moral, spiritual, uh, intellectual sense. You can be contaminated with original sin, they would have thought. And in the Middle Ages, you could have been contaminated with demons. Or now we talk about depression being cont a contagion. We talk about anxiety contagion. We talk about suicide contagion. It is something that is within you, but not of you. Interestingly enough, the word contact comes from the same roots, contangere, and we use contact to describe that moment when dirty and disease-filled Europeans reach the Americans, Americas for the first time and encounter people who are extraordinarily healthy and have never had to build uh, natural immunities. They're extraordinarily healthy. They're extraordinarily clean. And indigenous people have, their entire religious system is based on living in balance with the land, which means that deep ecology, that is science, has been raised to a unifying cultural principle. Now, the Europeans encounter these sophisticated people and do not understand, and they project their own savagery upon them. Because meanwhile, the European process of civilization has included ever-growing dense urban populations, epidemics, epidemics combined with overpopulation, open sewers, poor hygiene, and a low life expectancy. Pre-contact, indigenous peoples are thought to have made up 20% of the world's population. And today, they make up only 3%. The explorers bring over smallpox, influenza, bubonic plague, measles, and a host of other illnesses. And smallpox rages through North America. And it's estimated that 15 million people are killed in the course of a few centuries. And this is why when Europeans arrive in Canada, what is now Canada, and expand across it, the land seems empty. Instead, it really is a graveyard. But that illusion of emptiness remains, has, has resonance today with Canada's poorly unsustainable economy and our poor conservation record. Now, I am super privileged. I have managed to drop not out of not only art school, but I've dropped out of law school, journalism school, and graduate school. And it is only through my access to this elite education that I have learned the true history of bad bargaining between colonial governments and First Nations people. And in preparing for this, I did review some of the documents, and I'm going to talk about a few of them. The first being the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and this was issued by the British Crown upon uh, beating the French, in the, and uh, all French lands are ceded to Britain. And in this document, the Royal Procl Proclamation of 1763, it does three interesting things. The first, it contains an apology and a recognition that in the past, settlers and explorers have not dealt with First Nations people fairly or well. So within this document is an ambition. Secondly, it establishes and recognizes First Nations title to the land prior to the arrival of the Europeans and in an ongoing fashion. And lands can 
only be ceded to the crown. Otherwise, no settler should, should occupy those lands. And thirdly, it recognizes that First Nations people are not a heterogeneous group, but are multiple nations, and that it is the obligation of the colonial government to bargain on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. Yet, somehow, we fast forward to 1879 and the establishment of the Indian Act. Now, first off, this codifies Columbus's geographical mistake. This is not India. And the Indian Act, by its very name, it is a dual violence. First is in the erasure by its name of the numerous different First Nations into one homogeneous group. And second, the second violence is the policies and ideas that are contained within it and all of its subs subsequent revisions to this day. Now, I don't have time to talk about all of the atrocities that the Canadian government have committed against First Nations people, but we'll just bring up a few. Right now, today, our government has spent $2 billion fighting in the court so they don't have to fund First Nations children on reserve at par with every other child in Canada. Two billion dollars. And if we go back a little bit in the past and uh, the reserve system and the past system that Indian Affairs first implemented was a huge inspiration to the South African government in its implementation of apartheid. And finally, the treatment of First Nations people in Canada by colonial governments was an inspiration to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis in their design of the final solution and the concentration camps. Now, somehow, we seem to, at least if you're a good person, be able to acknowledge that the effect in World War II of a government wholeheartedly bent on the extermination of an entire people, that that would yield traumatic results, not only to the survivors of that genocidal intent, but to their children and their grandchildren. Yet, I have noticed in Canada that we almost never apply the same compassion and grace to First Nations people who for over 150 three years has been enduring genocidal governments in the land that is their birthright. A little bit closer to home, and I, I have to thank Anishinaabe scholar Nigan James Sinclair. I had the privilege of working for him in graduate school before I dropped out. But the story that I was taught before my elite education was that in 1811, the Scottish Selkirk settlers come to the confluence of the Red and Assiniboine rivers and establish the first agricultural community in what will be Manitoba. Yet archeological evidence shows that First Nations people have been farming corn and potatoes in the area of Netley Creek for over a thousand years and who do you think the Selkirk settlers got their seed from? At the time, the balance of power is held by Chief Peguis, and he develops a special relationship with Lord Selkirk. He becomes his and his colonists' friend and protector. And in 1817, Lord Selkirk, Chief Peguis, and a number of other First Nations leaders sign the Selkirk Treaty. This is the first European legal instrument signed in the land that will be Manitoba. And it does a few things. It recognizes Chief Peguis's authority to grant allotments along the Red River. Now, an allotment is not ownership. It is not property. If you go to a national park and you're in the campground, your campsite's yours for the time that you're living there, but you don't, you don't own it. It's a space for you to be able to live in relationship with land and the people around you. So it recognizes First Nations authority and 
Peguis and the other First Nations leaders, they don't sign their individual names to the document. They make the mark of their clan symbol, which means that to them, this is about relationship. In the same way that the animals have welcomed humans into their family, Peguis is offering the new European settlers a place in this relationship with the land and all of the creatures occupying it. The first legal instrument in Manitoba recognizes First Nations law. But then 1870, Manitoba becomes part of Canada. In 1871, Treaty Number no. 1 is signed. And in the meantime, Chief Peguis and his descendants, they have Christianized, they have Anglicized their names, and at the urging of Anglican missionaries, they have settled in the St. Peter's Preserve, which is sort of North Selkirk, and they have developed a successful agricultural community. They have done everything their colonial partners in this brave new society they're developing have asked. They have a successful agricultural economy. And as Canada, after Canada is formed and more white people come into the area, there's a problem with that. There's a bunch of dirty Indians on this prime agricultural land, but now with these stupid laws, there has to be a legal vote to get them to cede their land, and three times the St. Peter's Reserve people make it clear, no, we do not want to leave. So a plan is hatched by the colonial government, and in September 1907, government agents come on a ship to Netley Creek. And they meet the, there's so many people that meet the boat from the St. Peter's Reserve that the agents realize that if they took this boat right now, they would lose. So instead, they do a little backroom dealing with certain First Nations, promising more money and more land if they vote to secede, to secede the community. They ply people with alcohol and they learn that in four days, everyone in the community is going to be going hunting and fishing. So they make a plan for a meeting that day when most people are out of the community and they put up a sign in English in the store. <laughs> now, nobody it goes to the store every day in the day, these days. You don't go to the store every week. You maybe go to the store once a month, but they place a little sign there. And yet the day arrives and still like 200 people show up. So they're actually not allowed into the store where the meeting is happening in English in a community where no one speaks it. And in fact, the only words said in Cree were, hey, everybody want $90? Come stand over here. Yet, miraculously, the vote is 97 to 108 to leave. And suddenly, the government agents pull out this piece of paper and a document um, about this land sale is suddenly presented. It's almost, well, you have to see, remember, there's, there are no printers. There are no fax machines. There's no way of instantaneously producing a legal document in those days. It's almost like this whole thing was a fait accompli from the beginning. We don't even know if the people who voted were actually reserve members. And in the next year, the, gov the government forcibly relocates the members of the St. Peter's Reserve and gives their land that they have farmed, that they have put their blood, sweat, and tears to develop into, gives them to white people, white settlers, and the white settler accrue the value of First Nations labor. So where does that leave us? Well, right now, the first thing for sure is that no act of will 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 away the coronavirus, nor can we by an act of will return to some kind of old normal. There is no more old normal. This is the beginning of the new normal. And we don't even have a, a, enough information about the pandemic to know what the right questions are to ask about it. And how well was that old normal working anyway when the gap between the really rich and the rest of us is increasing? 
during the bubonic plague, some what would happen is at times is that plague victims would be shut into their houses and the windows and doors would be boarded up and they would be abandoned. And that reminds me of all of the old people in Ontario and Quebec dying in their own feces and urine in personal care homes. And that just sounds like a terrible way to be as a society. But we won, I hear some white people saying. The social Darwinist fantasy of survival of the fittest is irrelevant. We are a global population of 8 billion people. Most of us can't feed ourselves. Most of us can't clothe ourselves. Most of us can't build our own homes. We are globally interdependent. And right now we have a chance to practice the global cooperation that we will need when climate change rains down on us. So. I want to sit on a patio and have a drink. I want hockey. I want a haircut. Is this a time where we want to talk about what's me and mine and ownership and property? Or maybe we need to take lessons of politics of relationships. Relationships not only between all human beings, but between all living creatures. And wouldn't it be a beautiful thing? beautiful thing if what the pandemic taught us was that our most vulnerable citizens need to be taken care of in order to protect all of us. Is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friend, then let's keep dancing, but stay six feet apart. Let's bring out the booze and have a ball. If that's all there is. Ooh, Andrea, that was amazing. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for your truth. It's 9.30ish and uh, I'm hungry. I, I didn't have dinner. Usually right, usually right now about fringe, I'd be having like some mini donuts to get me through the night. Oh, absolutely. I love those. But I'm actually craving something else right now. Oh. Huh. Uh, what could it be? Pizza? Mm, no, that's boring. Something different, something would satisfy me, satisfy the soul. You some, know what I mean? Some gelati from, from New Cheese? No, not that. Uh, so I, can, I can almost smell it. I feel like I can smell it in the air. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but um, did you guys order Skip the Dishes? Because mm, nope. India Palace just showed up with Yes, what? they answered to my I prayers. I didn't order it, but I will take it. India Palace, that, I've been talking about butter. That was what I was. Yes. That's the oh stuff right there. Oh my gosh, here's a butter chicken. Oh, that's so fringy. So fringy. I got my samosa. Uh, I want to dig in right now. I want it. You can dig in right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but we got a. Yeah, a let them watch us. It, so, other, other than butter chicken. Uh, what do you like having at the fringe? Well, let me think now. I mean, I, I have to say I love the mini donuts. Yeah. I, I'm a strong supporter. I yeah, yeah. Them. How about you at home? Tell us what your favorite food is, what your favorite food vendor, uh, pizza, KYU grill, uh, falafels, Nucci's gelati, Give them a holler and don't forget to visit them. Check out their websites across the city. Uh, yeah. Samosas, yes. Uh, New Cheese, India Palace. What yeah. else do we got? Oh my gosh. Beer. Uh, Corey Wojcik and Beer. Beer's a food group. Yeah, we talked about that last night, I think. Oh yeah. It's the liquid diet, right? Yeah, whatever gets you through the fringe. Yeah, it helps the digestion. Okay, uh, first bite. Try. Let's see what happens here. You bet. Oh my gosh, this tastes like fringe. Mm. Oh my goodness. Let me just, yeah. 
Yeah, that's not COVID friendly, but that's okay, man. I love you. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Try the samosas. See what's up with that. Mmm. Win-win. Oh, win-win. Oh, perfection. You know what? We have a very special guest. One of Winnipeg Fringes, one of the Canadian Fringes uh, favorites. From Victoria, BC, I believe, we have Mike Delamont joining us. How's it going, brother? Hey. I'm just going to get Mike's sound here. I can't hear you, Mike. You got to unmute yourself, I believe, Mike. In this age of technology, how about now? How about there now? you go. You have to be your own tech. There I can hear go. you now. I can hear you now. It worked, worked two seconds ago. It's already falling <laughs> apart. <laughs> how fine. is your food? Oh, it's fabulous. It's fabulous. Do you have a favorite fringe food? I saw you holler last night. I don't know. I always go to shawarma con. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's not the though the 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 pizza truck at the fringe. That's that's a go to. And yes. That, that yeah. It's a it's the a pretty beautiful pizza. place. Nice. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good. We miss you. How's it going man? for you guys? Oh, I, we were just talking about. Uh, I I bumped into Charlie Ross from uh, One Man Star Wars last night, and he's like, "We should be in Winnipeg right now." And I was like, "Yeah, we should." It's weird to not be there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but it's been lovely to be able to watch and see everybody uh, doing their shows in this this weird little time we're in. So it, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and sorry, I'm just enjoying the food so much. I'm lost in the food. <laughs> you should be. You should be. If I could choose me or food, I, it was. It would always be food. <laughs> food. Food is a much better. Choice. Oh, absolutely. You're speaking to my heart, man. It's good. Right there. Good. <laughs> so, a uh, little sentimental question: What are you going to miss most about not being in Winnipeg? Oh goodness. Um, uh, there's such a great feeling of of uh, of community, and I think that's you know some shows are great, some some shows aren't. Uh, when I when I do them, sometimes I don't like a show that I'm doing, but uh, to be there with the people and and to experience that very unique uh, uh, world is it, it's it's what you miss the most is bumping into people on the street and and, and having weird conversations. It's it's uh, it's a wonderful. Wonderful little uh, two weeks of time, and I think that's what it is. Those weird little moments that, that you have. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you have like a, an unbelie unbelievably monumental character, uh, God, as a Scottish <laughs> drag queen. You've come to Winnipeg outside of Fringe Time and performed for us, and we absolutely love you. How did you come up with, or how did you come by, uh, the character of God as a Scottish drag queen? Oh, it's been. It, uh, well, it started in 2006. I was doing a, a cabaret with a group called Atomic Vaudeville. And uh, we, we did a monthly cabaret and, and each month there was a through line. And uh, one month it was a, a battle of the bands between Jesus and Satan. And uh, I was Jesus's dad. So we, we wrote this silly character and it, it became, I certainly wouldn't have guessed that I would still be doing it 15 years later. Um, <laughs> But, uh, wow. but yeah, we thought it would be this fun, silly character. And uh, in 2011, I wrote the show, and, and now my wife and I write the shows together. So I like our, our, our two styles. Uh, I think they work really well together. And it's been a very cool experience to, to do it. I certainly didn't think it would be as, as uh, uh, big as it is. So it's, uh, I assume one day it'll stop and <laughs> I'll, I'll get a real <laughs> job. But, uh, but it's been a, a wonderful surprise. And it's been so cool to meet people all over. So yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it won't stop anytime soon. <laughs> That's what I hope to do. <laughs> Fingers crossed. We shall see. We shall see. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> but we um, we created this uh, pandemic version of the show, which we're going to tour uh, to uh, Edmonton and to Winnipeg in the fall. And uh, so we, we thought it would be fun to do a very a short version of the show uh, in a digital format for, for Winnipeg Fringe. It was very nice to be asked to be a part of it. I, I never know if I'll, I'll be included, so it's always fun to be on the team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, all night we've had comments waiting for Mike Delamont, waiting for Scottish goddess, Scottish drag queen. So <laughs> uh, very sweet. I don't think we'll, we'll, we'll keep the fans too, too much longer. But uh, well, one more question for you. Uh, challenges and exciting things 
about creating online contact, uh, online content, and, and thoughts on theater and where we are in the world right now. Well, it's it's an interesting place that we're at. I think um, Chase Paget and I we we're both going to do uh, my show and Six Guitars back to back in Toronto. Very very big uh, opportunity for both of us. Right at the very start, I was supposed to open March twentieth. And uh, so we, it was right at the very beginning of all of this. So the conversations were had of, do do we even do this? Because you don't want to be the, the the epicenter of a pandemic uh, with your little comedy shows. So mm-hmm. uh, so it's been trying to figure out how to do this and now how to come back safely and slowly. But the nice thing is that the reason we're taking so much time is because the focus is on the safety of our friends and our fans and our family. So that's what's slowing things down is making sure that as we move forward, that people are safe. So it's a very wonderful silver lining in mm. uh, in all of this very scary time is that what is slowing us coming back is the protection and, and the safety. Um, so it's, it's neat to have opportunities like this over the next few days to, to, speak to fans and to to let people see our art so i i tend to not want to put things online i don't think i always think people won't want to watch so Mm -hmm. uh so i get (laughs) but i've been you know every once in a while i put something up but uh it's been amazing to see because some people in this moment you know it's like a a, you know it's like a diamond you know with enough pressure sometimes you get something really beautiful and uh some (laughs) so there's been some really amazing uh, creations to watch. So for me as an artist, I don't feel like I've done much beyond podcasts, but uh, as just a person who enjoys watching the arts, it's been really amazing to see all the phenomenal stuff that people have been able to put out. So yeah. it's, uh, it's a scary time, but it's a very, very inspirational time. So yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thanks sure. for having me. No, no, I, I, I don't want to keep our fringe fans from from this amazing uh, piece of theater that you made for us. So, <laughs> wait, I, this is my this is my backstage thing. I uh, we we shot it, uh, we filmed it, and wrote it specifically for the Winnipeg audience. And uh, I had a bit at the very start where I wore a mask and then I took it off. And so my hair is ridiculous through the whole thing <laughs> because I, I it was a, an N95. It was substantial, so it went all the way around. And uh, so I took it off, and I think just the static of it has made my hair. Go, <laughs> so, uh, so there's been an edited chunk out of the start. So when people see my hair look uh, like a disaster zone, uh, that's why. That's why. I had a funny, funny joke about a mask that got cut. So, yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> thanks for the candid view, Mike. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thanks for having me. It's so nice to chat with you. Yeah, for sure. Stay safe, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in 2021. I'm very excited to come back. Awesome, awesome. Thank you again, Mike. Oh, it's, yeah, you betcha, you betcha. So we have uh, God is a Scottish Drag Queen, a special pandemic edition. Please enjoy. Yay. God is a 40 plus white drag queen wearing a purple and green floral duster, black framed glasses and a short black wig with a chin in a chin length bob. She sits in front of a white wall with the title, God is a Scottish drag queen pandemic edition in gold lettering framed against a purple border in a computer graphic to the left of the screen. God, take it away. to a very special pandemic edition of God is a Scottish Dry Queen. I am your host, God. Hello. It's nice to have you here. Thank you so much to our dear friends at the Winnipeg Fringe Festival for having us. Oh, I'm so excited. Now, I I do want to see... Oh, it's a mess. Now, I do want to see uh, during this, because we are in a very bizarre time, I would ask that you sit about six feet away from your screen during the whole thing just to be safe. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for being here. What a strange time. The Winnipeg Fringe Festival has had to close its doors for the first time since its existence. And it feels weird, doesn't it? It it doesn't feel like summer without the Winnipeg Fringe. I I mean, has summer even started, really, 
until you filled your children full of pierogies and $10 lemonades and then watched a 40-year-old unemployed Australian man juggle a unicycle in front of a large BDSM dungeon cube. It's what it looks like. Now, I am excited to be here, and we are at a distance. But hold on, before we go on, I do have to say, I love those pierogies. Those pierogies are fantastic. That better than Baba truck. Oh, they're so good. I do also like what an aggressive flex it is to call your pierogi restaurant better than Baba's when there is already a very famous pierogi restaurant called Baba's. Who does that? That's that's a me. That's like opening your own Italian restaurant and calling it better than the Olive Garden. It's so good. I mean, you don't have to call it better than the Olive Garden. You can just call it De Luca's. We'll fill in the gap. I miss De Luca's so much. But we are talking to each other now at a distance over the interwebs because of a worldwide pandemic called the Corona virus, a virus the likes of which we have never seen in our lifetime, except for all of those other times we saw something like this in our lifetime. But it's a different time. Hands are being washed more than they ever have before. Who knew that you could wash a wrist? Oh, thumbs have never been cleaner. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. And, and it's a big thing because people do not like to bathe. They don't. I had to promise you eternal life just to get you to wash your pits and your privates. It's true. That, that's actually how baptism was invented. Not a lot of people know that. Not a lot of people know that, but that's how it started. Oh, baptism. What a fun and cute way to, to say, you know, waterboarding a baby. Oh, baptism. It's so clean and crisp. I like it. Now, a lot of people in this very trying and scary time ask the question, what would Jesus do? And he would do exactly what you are doing now. He would bathe and then quarantine because that's what Jesus did. It did. Uh, after Jesus was baptized, he went into the desert for 40 days. That's where the phrase quarantine comes from, is from Jesus' time in the desert. Uh, the word quarantine uh, comes from the Italian word quaranta, yeah, which means 40, or quarantina, which translates roughly to 40 days. And anybody who is anybody has done 40 days. I mean, Jesus did 40 days. Uh, Noah did 40 days. Moses did 40 days. You know, even Josh Hartnett did 40 days. Whatever happened to Josh? I will never know. But we are well beyond 40 days now. We have done 40 days four times over. We have been in this weird limbo now for 120 days. That's a long time. Even Jesus has tried a white claw, you know, made that fancy TikTok coffee. <laughs> I was going to say he tried his hand at making sourdough bread, but we all know how good Jesus is with the loaves of bread. Oh. So good. They're so crispy on the outside, fresh on the inside. Ah, they're delightful. You should see him with fishes and with wine. Oh, so good. During this time, people have chosen to, to wear masks. I had one. I don't know where it went. But people are wearing masks to not only protect themselves, but to protect their community. Lots of people wearing masks. Uh, lots of people wearing masks uh, wrong. Lots of people wearing masks uh, with their nose popping out over the top. No, that's not how you wear a mask. Wearing a mask with your nose popping out over the top is like wearing trousers with your dick sticking out the zipper. Refreshing? Yes. Appropriate? No. But the world is starting to open up. People are starting to courageously walk into the streets to see what's what's happening. You know, businesses are starting to, to open their doors again. Even professional sports are starting to come back. Hockey is coming back. That's right. The NHL will start filming games inside empty arenas. Can you imagine that? 
being a hockey team with absolutely no fans in the arena? Well, again, I guess for the people of Winnipeg, that's probably not that far-fetched. But for other teams, oh, heartbreaking. Just heartbreaking. I can't even see you right now, and I know that you are so angry. It delights my whole heart. But it's not just sports that are coming back. Either other businesses are opening. Thermia Spa is now open again. Oh, yeah, because that's what you want to do. You want to go into a nice hot steam room with a total stranger during a pandemic. Oh, thanks for visiting the Coronavirus Express Lane. Eh, some places should not be open. But during this time, this unprecedented time, the world has been shaken by a virus which at this point has taken more than half a million lives. It has also been shaken up by an, a long overdue change in the narrative and a fight for equality with the now very famous Black Lives Matter movement. For those of you that are living under a rock and haven't seen the news, uh, Black Lives Matter protests took to the streets. They stormed government offices with large heavily armed assault rifles, and the police stood by and quietly watched. Um, that can't be right. Oh, sorry, I got it wrong. I got it wrong. Sorry. Um, it was white people protesting that they wanted to go outside during a pandemic without masks. They were the ones that stormed government buildings with assault rifles and the police did nothing. Um, turns out uh, the Black Lives Matter moment where, where people were, were protesting for equal rights and, and, and against police brutality, uh, they were tear gassed, beaten and shot at with rubber bullets. So, yeah. That's where we're at in 2020. Uh, I, I am excited. I am excited for when the art comes back, when live art comes back. I'm excited to see the change, to hear stories of people of colour, to have artists of colour tell their stories because those stories are important and deserve to be heard. Uh, the Bible is filled with, with stories of people of color. Now, don't don't tell white people this, but other really other than the Romans, there's no white people in that book. Not a one. Everyone is a person of color in the Bible, except for the Romans. And I know, I even Jesus, that that painting that your nan has on her wall of white Jesus. Yeah, it's a fake. Jesus never looked like that. My son is a bearded, brown-skinned Palestinian Jew with a Mexican name. He tried to come back a few years ago, but the Americans kept him in secondary holding ever since. Hmm. It's a good joke. But people are angry. People want their, their, their flags and their statues. They want their statues because that's how people learn about history, from statues. No! Nobody learns about history from statues. The only thing that anybody could possibly learn from a statue is that back in the day, politicians and warriors were large metal green men covered in bird shit. Oh, majestic. People learn from stories. They learn from museums as well. Museums wonderfully adapt with the times. They tell new stories as things change. They, they adapt with how things are told. And, and no museum in the world would entirely ignore a marginalized group's story. That place is the worst. It's the worst. That place needs to go. Just put something in there that people of Winnipeg actually enjoy. You know what, because of how the Canadian Museum of Human Rights has treated LGBTQ people, I have decided to start my own Museum of Human Rights. That's right, I've started my own Museum of Human Rights and I'm calling it better than the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. Oh, seems apropos. I'm about out of time. Uh, it has been an absolute delight to come here and to chat with you. Um, I hope that you're staying safe during all of this nonsense. I hope you're wearing a mask and washing your hands and, and staying six feet apart. I'm very excited to be back in Winnipeg to see you all again. 
and I hope to do so very soon. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>
winnipegfringe.com. We have plenty of online content, online shows for you to check out. They go from donation to pay what you can to free to even like we have at Fringe, $12 maximum shows. So check it out at winnipegfringe.com. Uh, we have so much online content. Support your Fringe artists so uh, they can come back and see you in 2021 live here in Winnipeg. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining me. It's 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 amazing when you work in Winnipeg. Oh, everyone's like, uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Everyone's like, do you know this person? Do you know this person? Because you're in Winnipeg, and unfortunately, I've never had the the blessing of working with you. So, thank you for joining me. Oh, absolutely, no problem. Right thank on. you again for having me. And thank you guys for joining us at Virtual Fringe. Uh, I will figure out this camera too. I'll figure it out one day. We're only halfway through. Maybe day three, day four. I'll get this camera thing going. Anyways, uh, join us here tomorrow. We have another uh, amazing group of artists, amazing group of fringe artists that you can come and support and watch online for free, and we can be with you virtually yours. Don't forget to hashtag WPG Fringe. Leave comments, leave likes, get into the grand prize, and we will see you tomorrow. Stretch for me. I'm getting called in the ear. Uh, stretch for me. Time. So, uh, Next year, next year fringe. Uh, are you planning next to participate? Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, hopefully we can perform in person again. You know, this year's a little different, but we're hoping for next year, you know, to really make more of a, a, a big deal, make it more exciting, have more energy. You know, I know we're a little bit restricted right now with something. Somebody told me something about, you know, who was saying, Mike said about the diamond, if you put enough stress in, you make something beautiful. And I think it's the same for next year. I think it'll be just like that. So to look forward to seeing the people, you know, and that energy you get from those people, I'm really looking forward to that and more food, of course. Can't yeah. Forget the food. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that we didn't talk about, uh, festivals, not being able to do festivals. Uh, you can't in Winnipeg, we can't do folk fest. There's no Winnipeg jazz fest, but there's an amazing festival, uh, sound off in Edmonton that usually happens. Tell us what that festival is about. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Sound is, you know, as you can see here, 100 decibels, we perform there at Sound Off. It's out in Edmonton. And, you know, it's across Canada, performers from all over, you know, deaf performers, uh, some who sign, some who do music. You know, it's a great variety. There's a great mix of deaf and non-deaf performers. And it's just an excellent place to, you know, really meet other people, get to know other performers, and because it really is a national event and it's a fantastic uh, opportunity to, you know, like, hey, you've done this before, um, and make those connections and really, you know, get to know people, it's, it's fantastic. And I know you actually performed with one of the deaf performers there for uh, The Tempest, right? Yeah, I was in Edmonton doing Tempest, a Shakespeare play, uh, half of the cast was were deaf performers, half the cast were hearing performers, and we shadowed each other, ASL and talking. It was absolutely amazing. You know, shout out to all my friends out there, Thurga, Sage, Haley, uh, Liz, Tifan, I miss you guys all so much. So I, I'm gonna take a chance to be selfish and say hello to all of you across Canada. <laughs> so thank you, thank you again, again. Visit us tomorrow, day three, just like the Fringe. We get better as it goes on. I don't know how we're going to get better than Jordan, but we are going to try. We're going to try. Uh, thank you again, <laughs> my friend, for joining us. Thank you all for joining us, and we will see you virtually tomorrow.